Okay, so uh, so let me continue with what I was uh, what I was doing yesterday. Yeah, this is nominally the the last lecture. I don't know if I'll be able to completely finish, but maybe we'll spill a bit into the discussion. Uh, so my plan is to yeah I started talking about these uh, multi-field integrals. Uh, and uh, so, the, uh, so the blackboard will all be in d equals zero, and then I'll have some slides in uh, d d bigger than zero, just to bring in a bit more physic physical systems into the game. So, so now, uh, and also I have I have some tech notes which I'll post uh, in a little while. So, so coming back to to this vector model. So the vector model has ON symmetry, right? So this is the ON, uh, ON symmetric model. Then we just have the action, which is, you would call this a double trace term, phi i phi i squared with some coupling g. Uh, and uh, the idea of solving it in the large end limit is to introduce an, an additional variable sigma. So this is just an identity for integrals. You just add this uh, i phi k phi k term, perform the integral over sigma with this extra sigma squared term, and this will exactly give you this term, right? You just integrate out, you shift uh, the sigma variable, and you obtain this, this action. Uh, and this is uh, something that's very easy to work out. Now, uh, and this works in all dimensions, not just in d equals zero, but in d equals zero, it's particularly simple. So now we perform the integral over phi k fields first, and we obtain uh, one over square root one plus two i sigma. Uh, so this can be in turn written as uh, six over root pi g. Right, integral d sigma e to the minus uh, minus six and sigma squared over lambda minus n over two uh, log one plus two i sigma, and then you see that this is a typical situation that's amenable to settle point evaluation because there is an n sitting here. Right, so, so to remind you, the reason the sun is sitting here is we already scaled, uh, introduced this <coughs> scaled coupling that we take n to infinity while keeping lambda equal to g n fixed. Right, uh, right, and this. So, <coughs> so everyone is with me, right, on this. Then you just find the settle point. You find the saddle point, and uh, the saddle point sits at, uh, you just vary this. The derivative of log is 1 over 1 plus 2i sigma. Then you find that there is a saddle, uh, saddle point, saddle point at sigma equal to minus i sigma tilde. And the sigma tilde satisfies the following equation. We have 12 sigma tilde over lambda is equal to 1 over 1 plus 2 sigma tilde. Just very basic algebra. Then you solve the quadratic equation, and you find that sigma tilde of lambda is equal to 1 quarter times square root of 1 plus 2 lambda over 3 minus 1. Right, uh, and then this is what appears in the exponents. So, so if you uh, write like the limit of log z over n is equal to f zero of lambda, that's just equal in terms of this sigma tilde. It's completely obvious. It just uh, equals uh, six sigma tilde squared over lambda minus one half log one plus two sigma tilde. And that's the exact solution of the large n problem, right? 
uh, exact, completely explicit solution of the large N. Uh, and what this does is it, it sums up all the bubble diagrams. So it sums up uh, the, the diagrams that look like this. Uh, etc. This is what we're summing, and this is the explicit sum. Uh, you can check that this matches to our perturbative evaluation. You get like minus lambda over 24 plus lambda squared over 144 and then minus 5 lambda cubed over 2592 dot, dot. Okay, and uh, it's uh, not that hard to read off the exact form actually of, of the uh, of the coefficients. It, it, it's a completely convergent series. Uh, well, just to impress you, you can write this. It's sum k equal 1 to infinity minus lambda to the power k, uh, 1 over 4k, k plus 1, 6 to the k, and then there is a binomial coefficient to k, k. Uh, and this is a convergent series. Uh, another thing you know, uh, so, so basically the story makes sense both for positive and negative lambda as long as they're sufficiently small. For positive lambda, it's going to be an alternating series. For negative lambda, it's same sign series, right? Okay, so then you can, but you notice some, something interesting happens because this sigma tilde develops some branch point at negative lambda, right? So th there is actually a finite radius of convergence due to the presence of the square root. Uh, so you actually find that there is a lambda critical, so, so only works for lambda bigger than lambda critical, and here lambda critical is just minus three halves. Minus three halves. So then, oops. Uh, oh, sorry. So let me move to another board. So then you can expand near this lambda critical, and you find that F0 of lambda near lambda critical has some, I'll just write uh, like A plus B lambda minus lambda critical, these uh, non-singular terms, and then you get something like two-ninths root two-thirds, lambda lam minus lambda critical to the three-halves, plus some further terms. So, so this is the leading, uh, the leading singular term that we're interested in, and this tells you something about the behavior of uh, the sum over graphs. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is, it's conventional to label this by this uh, susceptibility exponent. So here you find that this is gamma equal to one half. Uh, and the specialists on this call it the polymer exponent, polymer phase. And it's sort of clear why it's a polymer, because you're just summing over linear chains of bubbles. So it's a very simple theory of linear chains of bubbles. So, so <coughs> So this is how people in the 70s were solving polymer theories and, and so on. Okay, so just, uh, just to entertain you a little bit, uh, this, this type of solution with the sigma field, I think Juan already discussed this, it works above uh, in any dimension because you can always integrate out phi field by, at the expense of a determinant. Uh, so the solution is widely known for these vector theories. So in particular, uh, if we are be below four dimensions, this is called the Wilson-Fisher theory. So now I want you to look at this uh, blackboard. This is the, so you can add this d mu phi i squared term, and then this describes the O-N magnets that I was talking about uh, in my first lecture. And you always want to take the large N limit, keeping GN fixed. Then it's, uh, one can develop one over n expansion using essentially the same trick of introducing the sigma field. And then you obtain the following one over n expansions for various operator dimensions. So here, phi is just, uh, delta phi is phi i. The operator s 
is just phi i squared, phi i, phi i. Okay, and the operator T is the tensor operator, which is phi, phi i, phi j, uh, minus uh, 1 over n delta i j phi squared, uh, phi k, phi k. So it's just traceless, uh, traceless symmetric tensor. And then uh, uh, this takes some work to develop. Actually, people know these results not just in d equals 3, but as a function of d. And you can then compare them near four dimensions with 4 minus epsilon expansion. So you get these explicit numbers. Uh, it turns out that the 1 over n series is not great numerically for very low n. So for example, if you try to apply this to the physically relevant systems, which is n equal 1, the Ising model, or n equal 3, the Heisenberg model, uh, the 1 over n series is not so great because if you actually write out the, the coefficients, you find that del delta phi is 1 half plus something like 0 0.135 over n minus 0 0.097 over n squared. And then already the n cubed term is huge. So, so it's characteristic of these asymptotic series that the behavior of the coefficients tends to be not so good <laughs> once you go to sufficiently high order. Uh, and uh, even if you truncate to the very first term, you don't get a very good approximation. Uh, so, for, so for n equal 1, for example, you would, if you just keep these terms, uh, keep uh, three terms for n equal 1, gives uh, something like delta i equals 0 0.538, but the exact answer is 0 0.518 the exact uh, 0.518. So the, uh, the moral of the story is that large n expansion does not work so well for n less than 7 or so. And this was actually one of the big reasons why Wilson and Fisher resorted to this 4 minus epsilon expansion. If you, if you read the wilson Cogat review, they start with this opening sentence that of course, 1 over n expansion is great, but for this theory, it's just not numerically very nice for low n. Uh, uh, so, so basically, there are other techniques. Uh, so how, how are we going to test the 1 of, yes? Is yeah. there any reason from, like, the get-go that we could have found that the concept would be possible? Yeah, the, the one intuition is that when you do epsilon expansion, actually, you always see 1 over n plus 8 in the denominator. And they, and actually, this is from Wilson Koga. They say that means that it's just not going to work so well for n below 8. And that, that actually works out. But you have to really look at the guts of the theory before you know how well they... One thing that's for sure is that 1 over n expansion always works well for sufficiently large n. And the question is, if, is this sufficiently large n 3 or 33 or... <laughs> uh, so, so in this case, it turns out to be right around 7. And, and actually, people who do these Monte Carlo simulations, they rarely address these on with bigger than 6. Uh, but recently, and this, uh, this is going to be another interesting uh, topic of the school, is conformal bootstrap. They actually have no trouble studying the theory for arbitrarily large n. Uh, and so this is a plot from now a somewhat outdated paper, but I think Silvio Pufu will discuss some even more recent results. Uh, you see actually excellent matching to, for example, they did O10, O20, and so on. Uh, they see absolutely excellent matching between these crosses are the 1 over n expansion results, and these kinks is where the bootstrap people find the theory. So in some sense, the bootstrap now is a really good test for 1 over n expansion. You see that the, the things get like harder for low n, but, but you see very good uh, agreement. Yeah. What is the dotted line? 
The dotted line is this one over n curve. Like here you are plotting delta phi versus delta phi squared. Uh, and the dotted line is just taking, taking the results up to order 1 over n squared and just, just plotting them one versus the other. Like here, here are the results. Oops. Yeah, you're just truncating this, this series to the, f the, the, the available 1 over n squared, up to 1 over n squared terms and just plotting one versus the other. And you see that uh, the bootstrap somehow agrees very well for and certainly starting 10 and higher. Uh, I think that's very nice because another thing one could do is just to grind out the, uh, the Monte Carlo for higher, higher ON groups. That should also be possible. I'm told by lattice experts that anything just involving scalar fields is now considered relatively easy for, for lattice studies. Uh, so maybe that's another thing that, uh, since we're fans of large n, we can do like O n magnets for large n on a lattice and compare with these one over n results. That would be an even more direct test. Okay, so so that's uh, just to bring in a little bit of physics and depart from d equals zero for a second. So now let me go back to matrix series. Uh, yeah, so so I start. I already discussed the matrix and tensor cases, but now I want to give a slightly slightly uh, more elaborate discussion. So, for example, uh, we can consider uh, n equal to n squared uh, degrees of freedom uh, contained in this matrix phi A B. Right. I already wrote down what the action for this matrix is, right? We, we just have, uh, so the Z, Z matrix of G will be this uh, integral D phi A B over root 2 pi. And then we have E to the minus 1 half phi A B phi A B, and then minus G over 24 trace phi phi transpose phi phi transpose. It's a somewhat unconventional model from the matrices point of view. Uh, the most conventional is just Hermitian matrix model, but this uh, works just fine too. Uh, and then in this case, uh, uh, I think I already uh, discussed what the that in this case snails and uh, and melons both contribute equally, and in fact all planar graphs contribute. So so one can do the following exercise, which is uh, which is usually you to see that Hoft uh, proof of planarity, you basically usually uh, rescale phi to root n times phi. Then what's going to happen is that you will have an n here, and here you'll have n squared coming out, right? So you'll have n times lambda. We again keep gn equal lambda fixed. That's the Toft coupling. So now there is again an n uh, multiplying the whole action. And then this is something that uh, Johanna already uh, discussed. We basically have this double line notation, right? Uh, this double line notation, which uh, you'll see in a second. Uh, and uh, so each propagator, so an edge or a propagator puts in a factor one over n. The vertex, vertex puts in a factor of n. And then there is a crucial fact that every time you have a face, you have an index loop. Right, so you have an index loop, so a face. Uh, so here there is n times lambda, but we don't care about lambda. Lambda is something of order one, so we're just counting power of n. And face puts in a factor of n as well, so the net counting factor will be n to the power v plus e minus f, and that's just the Euler characteristic. So that was Toft's great discovery, one of his great discoveries. And chi is uh, 
right? Chi is equal to 2 minus 2G, right? Where G is the genus of the surface. So, so you see that the leading, uh, so, so when you look at the expansion of log, uh, so in this case you find that log Z matrix, Z matrix divided by N squared is equal to F0 matrix of lambda, then you can have a power N minus uh, 1 times F one half, uh, and so on, plus and minus two f one, and this is genus. So this label is the genus. So this is g equal to one half, which is uh, like a s two mod z two. It's an RP two real projective plane. Uh, so it's a non-orientable surface, but this one is just a torus. So this is g equal 1, which is just the torus. Uh, in the case of Hermitian matrix model, this term does not appear and everything walks in powers of n minus 2. Uh, but here it's very easy to see and, uh, and if you just explicitly evaluate graphs, you do see corrections of order 1 over n. It doesn't just give you 1 over n squared corrections. Okay, so now if you look at, so how are we going to find this f naught of F not matrix. This is a sum over planar graphs. So this is sum sum over vacuum planar graphs. So in this particular uh, case, there is a method which rather strongly depends on having d equals zero, which was uh, introduced in a very beautiful paper by Brzezinski on Parisian Zuber. So it's a the BIPZ solution of this uh, one matrix model. Okay, so let me explain. I assume some of you have seen this, right? Uh, yes, no? A little bit. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try to explain how this works. Yeah, this is a 1974 paper. It's very soon after Toft. Uh, uh, so Toft uh, explained why planar graphs are important, and then uh, they, being very strong in techniques of mathematical physics, immediately realized that there are some simple matrix, so-called matrix models, or simple matrix series, which are exactly solvable and realize this Toft solution. And basically, so you have this n squared degrees of freedom, but there is a reduction to n eigenvalues, redu effective reduction to n eigenvalues. So you, you basically just write this matrix phi as some left unitary matrix times kappa times right transpose. And this is just Kappa is the diagonal matrix of eigenvalues, namely kappa 1, kappa 2, da da dot, kappa n. So, so, and these are just real, uh, kappa i are real. Okay, and then, uh, then you, what happens is that, uh, the <coughs> you can, in the large end limit, uh, the, these eigenvalues, uh, uh, you can basically integrate, uh, uh, first of all, you can for any n integrate out these angles and write the following expression that z, z matrix of g is equal to product over a integral from minus infinity to plus infinity d kappa a delta Often this is denoted by lambda, but I already reserved lambda for Toft coupling, so I invented this kappa. Delta squared of kappa, and then you have e to the minus, uh, and that the weight is just e to the minus sum uh, from 1 to n, 
uh, kappa i squared plus g over 24 kappa i to the 4. So this is uh, called Dyson guess. So what is this delta? Anyone know what this delta is? Van der, Mo Van der Mond determinant. Van der Mond the determinant. So delta of kappa is just a product uh, i less than j kappa i minus kappa j. Okay, and what this, so when you exponentiate this, this gives you a kind of logarithmic repulsion forces between eigenvalues. So this potential for wants them to be, it attracts them to the origin, but they don't go on top of each other due to these logs that you get if you exponentiate. If you write this as e to the 2 log delta, so you get a kind of, uh, so then you introduce uh, the eigenvalue density. Yes, yeah, I, I, this delta comes about from uh, integrating out over the unitaries, right? So after, it's specifically after you, so there is a kind of reduction uh, from, there is a reduction, here I should really put, uh, I didn't keep track of careful normalization factor, but effectively what happened is that the angles completely decoupled in favor of this van der Mond, so you, there is a reduction from uh, reduction n squared to n degrees of freedom. And that's what allows this model in d zero dimensions to be so nice. This does not hold up in higher dimensions. In higher dimensions, you cannot just decouple the angles and everything becomes complicated. So, <coughs> so if you... So now the technique is it's similar to the subtle point. You also, you, you just have to solve a somewhat more complicated equation. So you introduce this eigenvalue density rho of kappa, eigenvalue density. This is just rho of kappa. <coughs> so it's really, uh, 1 over n times sum over the delta functions, delta of k, kappa minus ki, because the delta functions are like n particles sitting in this potential. But you can approximate this for large n by a smooth function. And then there is a beautiful technique. You get a certain, you essentially have to extremize the action for extremize log z. Uh, I will not go over this in, in great detail. It's completely, uh, it's in, uh, for example, this BIPZ paper, I highly recommend it. It's both historic and extremely clear. They just do a couple of pages of algebra and the solution is right there. So this, uh, so the solution, the BIPZ solution gives the following function for the eigenvalue density. Rho of kappa is 1 over pi, 1 half plus lambda over 6 times a squared of lambda, which I will define in a second, plus lambda over 12 kappa squared times square root uh, 4 a squared minus kappa squared. And then a squared of lambda, again, has this very simple square root structure. Square root of 1 plus 2 lambda minus 1. So this is also the same function, a squared. So this generalizes this famous Wigner semicircle law, which maybe you have seen. So for lambda equal 0, so for lambda equals zero, you just get then this uh, this is zero, this is zero, and you just get square root of uh, then a is equal to one, and you get the f the following distribution. This looks like a semicircle, right? And it ranges from two to minus two. The way it's normalized, 
right? This is just this classic Gaussian ma matrix model that Wigner was solving even in the 50s because uh, the, the idea was to approximate the energy levels of complicated nuclei by, by these distribution of eigenvalues of a Hermitian matrix. So you just basically think of a Hamiltonian of a complicated system as a random matrix and the simplest thing is to say it's Gaussian distributed which removes this term then you get the semicircle law but once you include lambda corrections there are some changes and then you can obtain the critical behavior so the critical behavior is the one that I, I was discussing last time that's what happens if you are making these planar graphs to be large right uh, so, so then you see that it essentially comes again from the square root branch cut contained in this a squared of lambda. So now you see that lambda c. Oh yeah, yeah. So then this row determines the f uh, what we need is this log z matrix. Uh, yeah, I already wrote down this f zero. So, in th so what you find is the following, that F0 of lambda in this matrix case has a very simple expression. When you plug in the eigenvalue density into the log Z, you find that it's just equal to 1 over 24, A squared minus 1, 9 minus A squared minus 1 half log a squared. So it's quite similar to what we had in the vector case. It was again some kind of polynomial thing in the log, p, uh, log piece. And then you can start expanding this for small lambda. For example, you get minus lambda over 12 plus lambda squared over 32. And this is explicitly checks out against planar perturbation series. But then the real value of this is that it buys you the, the solution to all orders. And in particular, the leading singularity. So when, you, when lambda goes negative and approaches this lambda c, right? So you see that this lambda c is equal to minus one half, just where this branch point is located. You see that uh, F0, as lambda approaches lambda C, behaves like this. So it will be like A plus B lambda minus lambda C plus C lambda minus lambda C squared. And then finally, you obtain the singular term lambda minus lambda c to the 5 halves. And this is something that caused a minor revolution in uh, our field uh, around 1988 or 89 because this actually agrees with Liouville's solution of quantum gravity. So this, this is a one, one uh, way to obtain the two-dimensional quantum gravity as an exactly solvable system. And you see here the big difference, right? In that case, we saw lambda minus uh, lambda c to the 3 halves. So it differs very much from the vector model, right? You see that in this case, in, for the vector model, we had 3 halves, and that was the polymer behavior. This one is something totally new. This corresponds to this gamma equal to minus 1 half, and this agrees with the... Uh, this is characteristic of 2D quantum gravity. And there are various ways to check this versus continuum calculations, but, but this is essentially uh, the story. And you see a very pronounced difference between sum over planar graphs and sum over bubble graphs in, in D equals zero. Okay, now just to entertain you a bit with some slides. Uh, so, so, I met, so the Toft motivation was, of course, uh, SU3 gauge theory. In 1973, everyone became convinced that, that SU3 gauge theory describes strong interactions. 
But it was already then clear that it's very hard to solve this theory because it becomes strongly coupled uh, in the infrared. So Tocht uh, whipped out this amazing paper where he said, let's expand in 1 over 3. Right? Uh, let's pretend that 3 is large and, and uh, work out this uh, 1 over n expansion for QCD. And he was motivated by SUN gauge theory. So as I mentioned before, so, so in the case, so for him, these are just the gluon, gluon lines. And this is the three gluon coupling with G and Mills. And since each gluon is in the a joint representation, you represent it as a fundamental and anti-fundamental. So hence, you get these orientable graphs because each propagator has these double arrows. And then you see that the index loop gives you a factor of n. So G and Mills squared times n has to be held fixed. And that's... Uh, essentially how this story works. So now uh, something I worked on a lot in the early 90s was this matrix quantum mechanics that's uh, above d equals 0 but still OK. It's a d equal 1 system which is still exactly solvable. And this was al also shown in this BIPZ paper. So in the Euclidean uh, quantum mechanics you, you, st you have an extra dimension x, this is the Euclidean dimension, and for example, this kind of cubic potential. And uh, the whole argument for planar graphs, which I exhibited, uh, uh, works out. You get the sum over orientable surfaces. If you're interested in details of that solution, I wrote a review uh, back in 91 about this. Uh, so. Um, it's very similar. Everything reduces to eigenvalues. In fact, that solution is even simpler than this because eigenvalues just act like free fermions in that potential. It, there is a, but the moment you go above d equal 1, all hell breaks loose and you can't solve it anymore. Even in d equal 1, there are some complications associated with the angular uh, sector with angular degrees of freedom if you're interested in it. But but the singlet observables are all exactly solvable. Uh, so now, uh, in that case, we had these discretized random surfaces, but embedded in one dimension. So for example, if you think about these dashed lines, they're just the Feynman graphs of phi cube theory. And think about the so-called dual lattice. The dual lattice is where you take the Feynman graph and just put a, a point at the center of each face and connect them up. And then you see that you get a lattice made out of triangles. And this is exactly what this discretized quantum gravity uh, is. And you see that you can mimic geometry by this because if there are six triangles that meet at the point, then the point is flat. But if there are fewer than six, it has positive curvature. If there are more than six, it has negative curvature. So you're summing over these models where curvature is implemented at places where triangles meet, and, uh, and everything basically works nicely. OK, so now, uh, so this model, a lot of people worked on it. It, it gives you a kind of model for two-dimensional string theory, uh, or people also call it C equal one matrix model, maybe some of you. I know some of you are working on this here some uh, but yeah it was a very popular subject between 90 and 92 or something and and still it's a, it's a very neat model it's a, it's similar to this model it has this nice exactly solvable flavor but it has a bit more physics in it because you can actually consider scattering you can consider like uh, you have a Fermi C filled by eigenvalues, and then you have uh, ripples on the Fermi surface and things like that. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring out is that uh, while if you go above d equal 1, things stop being exactly solvable, they become sort of more physically interesting. For example, Toft's original motivation for a large n was QCD. Uh, and uh, I think especially many people in the uh, lattice gauge theory community 
are pushing that now, including Tom, uh, Tom de Grand, our uh, local boss. <laughs> uh, so, so I won't show you slides from his paper. He's doing something a little bit more complicated, including baryons and mesons. But the most basic bound states, if you just take pure glue theory, no matter fields, just pure A mu field with F mu nu squared. Uh, maybe I should, in modern language, it's take n equal four superior mills and cross off the phi's and the psi's. <laughs> then you're left with pure glue, right? Uh, yeah, j just just this, right? Uh, so, for example, this, this plot describes the following theory: integral d three x minus one over two g n mil squared trace half mu nu squared. Very elemental theory. And just to make life easier, it's, uh, it's three-dimensional. So, so actually, g n mil, mil squared has dimensions, dimensions of mass. Uh, but still, confinement is a non-trivial phenomenon in this theory. And in fact, Feynman, in later years of his life, he really, really wanted to solve three-dimensional gauge theory analytically. He wrote some papers on that. <coughs> so I just wanted to show you evidence that in this theory, again, we... So what would you expect on general grounds? You basically expect that the masses of the bound states, so if you look at the mass, masses of the glue ball, for example, ma masses of uh, bound states, they will all be of order g young mil squared n. Just on dimensional grounds, times some pure numbers, times some number. And the goal of lattice gauge theory is basically to compute this number. Uh, and, uh, but, the, but that Hoft scaling predicts the, the presence of this factor of n. Uh, but, uh, and then these numbers, moreover, uh, will be, so there will be some, some expansion in 1 over n squared. There will be like uh, a0 plus a1 over n squared plus a2 over n to the 4 and so on. And uh, so Michael Tepper has worked on this for many, many years. And they obtained, uh, so this is one of the more recent papers. It's a plot of some dimensionless ratio, like the masses of spin zero glue balls divided by square root of the string tension. The string tension is, uh, that's sort of one way of parametrizing it. Uh, alternatively, you could just divide it by g n mil squared n. String tension is the tension of the confining string. Hmm? Oh, it's, oh, sorry, sir. I'll, I'll correct it. it it's, it's a little, yeah, I'll post this and uh, I'll correct it. Uh, but uh, you can find by these authors. What happened is that it's a disinfringed and one. <laughs> it's the number here. Uh, okay, so you see that it matches extremely well to this idea that there is one over n squared expansion. You, they computed them for n up to 16. For SU16 gauge theory, they actually obtained results, and they're plotting it. So this is low n. They're plotting it versus 1 over n squared, and you see these nearly straight lines, but then they start curving a little due to admixture of 1 over n to the 4 corrections. So this is a really nice sort of uh, nice way to understand the extrapolation of 3D gauge theory to, to large n. And this is a similar plot for spin 2 bound states. You see that there is more curving going on already for the lowest state, but the matching to this Hoff scaling is still very, very nice and very convincing. So even when we cannot solve the theory exactly, it's still very useful to think. So the idea of this is that to, while we cannot solve the large n gauge theory exactly, we from 
just doing simulations for finite n can extrapolate to the large n limit and the values on this axis are exactly the, the large n results and maybe one day someone will devise a better analytical approximation it will have to match these numbers in fact people do people keep working on this so so that's a very very big it's sort of original motivation some of the original motivation for large n but Yeah, yeah, it's different excitations. Yeah, like even if you say in spin two, there are many different bound states. Yeah. Like the lowest one, the next one, they're like what people call radial excitations of that. So you get a very complicated spectrum just out of this very simple model, right? Okay, so now, uh, now uh, I'll go back to tensors. Uh, and I wanted to, uh, now I can already tell I'm going to run out of time. But, uh, so let me, I want to show that in D equals zero for tensors, there is a similar solution to the one that I worked out for vectors and, and matrices. So let me go back to D equals zero for... Okay, so now our goal is the following. We take this, uh, what I discussed le yesterday, uh, phi ABC with O and cube symmetry. And then I have Z tensor of G, uh, of G, which is the integral D phi ABC. I mean, this implies the product. And then again, we have e to the minus 1 half phi ABC phi ABC. And then here we have just take this tetrahedral interaction, G over 24, this phi A1, B1, C1, phi A1, B2, C2, A2, B1, C2. To C1. Okay, so so in this case the propagator is just the product. So it's still it's an example of our multi-field problem with little n being n q. Okay, and then in this case I already showed to you using graphs, using these uh, stranded graphs with colors, why the melons dominate over. Uh, why the melons dominate over snails, but now you can do a completely thorough job. You can, for example, if even at finite ten, you can just start expanding in this phi and just see what's going on. So the propagator, we take phi a1, b1, c1, phi a2, b2, c2, is delta a1, a2, delta b1, b2, Delta C1, C2, right? Uh, and then start contracting the vertices with this. And I already wrote like what the, you know, you can just write, literally start contracting fields using Feynman rules with these propagators. And you get the following expression for log Z tensor. There is an overall factor of N cube, which is expected because there are N cube degrees of freedom. And then you see that there is minus 1 over 8 and G. And this comes from this figure 8 graph. And then there will be plus 1 over 288 and Q plus 3N plus 2 times G squared. This comes from the, the Mellon graph. And then there will be plus 1 over 16 n squared g squared 
plus order g cubed. And this comes from this, uh, this triple bubble graph. And then you see very explicitly without any, this is an honest calculation at any n. In particular, for n equal 1, this simply will reduce to just our one field problem, which is our Bessel function. Remember this uh, Bessel k function. So all these numbers will agree for n equal 1 with those numbers. But you see that this one dominates, right? This one dominates. Uh, and we have to take the scaling where lambda is, is g n to the 3 halves fixed. And then this graph was suppressed, and this graph is suppressed, and only melon dominates. So in this scaling, this just becomes uh, uh, 1 over 288 times lambda squared. And then the next, w and then there is a series actually only in even powers of lambda. There is a series in even powers of lambda. And how, how can we determine this series? Okay, uh, so first of all, you need to prove that, uh, that only melons dominate. I have a slide on this in a second, but let's just assume that only melons dominate. So the next one will be, uh, will be the following graph. So the lambda to the 4 graph will be this one with two melons, and this, uh, this will be the dominant graph, and so on. Okay, so our goal is to uh, determine this. So in this limit, you want to determine this, uh, this whole function becomes what we would call Fz, F0 melon as a function of lambda. So amazingly enough, there is an analytic solution for it too. But it doesn't come from, uh, some of you have been asking me, is it something like going to eigenvalues? Well, I don't know what, how to think about eigenvalues of three tensor. Uh, but it comes from the following, from the solution of the Schwinger-Dyson equation, which I think Juan already mentioned. So, so there is the Schwinger, Schwinger-Dyson Dyson equation. And it essentially looks like, in the zero-dimensional system, looks like two lines. So one of them is just to say that the exact two-point function, so when we say the bare two-point function is this, right? This is the bare one. But the exact one will have a factor of g, right? That's the exact propagator, right? We always know that the exact propagator uh, g g is equal to 1 over 1 plus sigma, right? Where sigma is the sum of the one particle irreducible graphs, right? This is one particle irreducible graphs. And here you obtain the following expression for sigma. So this sigma 1 is nothing but the following graph. Uh, it's uh, where these are the exact propagators. So these are the exact uh, g's. So the reason is that because you're it, what you're doing is you're iterating the equation that, uh, so this generates for you the following sum for g. g is this plus this plus all sorts of other corrections. So, so now what this is is just the exact green function that enters in. So you take the leading perturbative result and just replace these by the exact green functions. So that's, that's the crucial insight. And this is uh, in one of the papers that I submitted for reading. It's by Bonzam et al. Bonzom et al. 2011, they obtained this equation and they solved it. So more precisely, when you include the factors relevant for our model, you obtain the following 
you obtain that sigma is equal to minus lambda squared over 36 uh, g g cubed, g of lambda cubed. Okay, now combining these equations, you see that g, now g inverse of lambda is equal to uh, 1 minus uh, lambda squared over 36 g cubed of lambda. And that's the equation we need to solve. So it's just an equation which is like some, uh, uh, it's a quartic equation, right? Because then you can multiply this by g and get the quartic equation. And this equation has been solved. I, I won't write the exact formula. There are some cube roots and square roots, but there is an exact solution in the notes, which I will submit and also in their paper. And then there is a magic relation uh, between that and F naught. You know that G is equal to 1 plus 4 lambda d by d lambda F naught f naught of lambda. So once you solve for g, you can determine f naught through through this uh, this relation. Yes. Well, you know, uh, I think you pick the one that uh, matches onto perturbation theory. That you always have to pick some branches of cube roots and and so on. But it's uh, I just. In the interest of saving time, it's somewhat similar looking to this, uh, except a little bit more complicated. You again have some auxiliary function which involves cubic roots, uh, and then you then you have this g expressed in terms of this auxiliary function, and then you find the following exact solution. So after all this work, you find an exact solution. Uh, where the, all the coefficients in this expansion are determined. We find that uh, F0 of lambda is, uh, is some A2n lambda over 6 to the power 2n. And this A2n again involves some binomial coefficient 1 over 8n for n plus 1, for n plus 1, n, just the binomial coefficient. So the first few coefficients, like the first melon matches, uh, matches this, you get 1, 8 times 1 over 36, and, and so on. But the, the really fun stuff is that, uh, so this expansion is again convergent. And, uh, and when you s look at what F0 is doing as lambda approaches lambda critical, uh, you see that it actually has lambda critical squared minus lambda squared to the power 3 halves again. So it's again, so we have polymers again. And that's something that's rather unexpected because so somehow you started with this very simple solvable theory for vectors, which gives you this lambda minus uh, lambda uh, three halves, delta lambda three to the three halves scaling exponent. Then you moved on to matrices, obtained a much more complicated theory with a different scaling exponent. And then you drop back to this, and uh, and voila, it's it's again. Uh, it's again back to polymers. So, and this is one thing that uh, to me is, is still rather surprising. Uh, and let me now show you a few slides to try to explain physically a little bit more why, why this is sort of, uh, in some sense, the expected result. Uh, okay. oh. Yeah, yeah, because everything is an expansion in lambda squared. So you, c you can just introduce some g, which is lambda squared. And, and in terms of this g, 
Yeah, G is positive, and when it reaches the maximum value. Uh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, it's a different, yeah. yeah. You introduce, I don't know, some other parameter. Let's call it like y is equal to lambda squared. Like somehow it's because all the odd powers in G are suppressed. They cannot contain melons. So, so you only get even powers, and that's why you obtain something like this. Yeah, yeah, so indeed there are two two branch points, right? But this is what happens, like for example in cubic matrix model the same thing happens. Uh, there is again like Q2, uh, because there is a symmetry under G going to minus G. Okay, so, so now let me show a few slides. Maybe I'll give myself five more minutes since it's my last lecture. Uh, so first, the product groups that I already discussed. Okay, but I wanted to show you this nice uh, uh, slide where you see that, so this is the, surf, uh, the, di uh, the diagram generated by this phi AB theory that I solved for you here. You see that there are alternating green and red loops. So when you think about these dual lattice, the dual lattice are these, you think of these as squares, there are two types of alternate uh, vertices that alternate. The red vertex, green vertex, red, green. And then when you glue the squares together, you always glue red to red and green to green. So it gives you a tiling of a random surface in terms of squares. And again, you see that, for example, if four squares meet, that's a flat point. There is no deficit angle because you, you think about each square as having 90 degrees. So if the angles add up to 360, then it's a flat point. If they add up to more, then it's a, uh, it's a negative curvature. And if it's less, then it's positive curvature. So you, you get this type of uh, nice surface, and this is how you solve two-dimensional quantum gravity. It's one of the variants of the theory. So you don't need Hermitian matrices. You can have these two colored graphs and so on. But now. Uh, yeah, if you go to to these uh, tensor theories, so this is something I already explained last time. This is the structure of the vertex with two middle lines passing underneath each other. But here, here is one striking thing I wanted to show, which is uh, if you look, if you look at so so these are the, all the vacuum graphs which. I even removed the snails. The snails are like you can remove them by mass or normalization in any case. And you see that, uh, uh, so this sort of removes some of the bubble graphs, but, but still the number of melon graphs is tiny compared to the total number of graphs. And it's even tiny compared to the total number of planar graphs. So the only melons are graph number one, then graph number three over there, that's like the two melon ones, and then there are two more here. So out of 27 graphs here, you only see four melonic graphs. And that's why this tensor theory is so simple. And it's the sum over these melonic graphs is what we, we solved there. Uh, so, so it's still a very, very simple theory. And uh, okay, so now, uh, just in the final uh, stretch of the talk, I wanted to go over a little bit over this melonic limit again. So this is already something I showed last time. But the crucial thing is indeed that when you do this melon insertion into the propagator with the type of vertex we have, we have uh, basically three additional loops, right? We have the additional uh, green loop here, red loop here, and the blue loop that goes around here. So you get g squared n cubed, and that's why we have to define lambda as g n to the three halves. Uh, and then in this limit, you you can look look at vacuum graphs, and you see that they really have the right uh, the right structure. They have exactly the right maximum number of loops to contribute. Uh, at leading order. Like when you divide by n cubed, this is the, uh, 
the single melon, it gives lambda squared. This is the double melon, it gives lambda to the four, and so on. But all other graphs turn out to be suppressed. Uh, so, for example, if you look at if you look at this uh, this graph, this is the cubic graph. If you count out how many loops you can have, you only have six index loops. So this turns out to be suppressed compared to melonic limit by n to the minus three halves. So it turns out that none of the odd orders contribute. They, they simply cannot contribute. Okay, so, so now let me just, I think this series of talks would not be complete if I didn't actually try to show you why this works. Uh, and here, so here are basically two slides, which I don't think it's a complete proof, but it essentially gives you the reason why this theory can be proven to be melonic, which is the following. <coughs> so let's take let's take a melon, and as you see, uh, you see that the stranded graph has three separate colors corresponding to three O-N groups. Then suppose you just erase the middle color, like the blue color. Then you're left with the kind of graph you had in the matrix model, just double colored graph, uh, double line graph. But those we know how to count the topology of. We know how to count the power of n because we are equipped with this uh, Euler characteristic. Right, so what do we want to co uh, count? We want to count the number of faces in this graph. Right, and the number of faces gives us the number of index loops. So, so then this is just the Euler theorem that f minus e plus v is equal to chi. So now we also have a constraint that the number of edges is equal to twice the number of vertices. This is just from the fact that we have a quartic graph, right? So, so having erased the blue line, we get that f Rg, the number of faces in the red-green graph, is just the Euler characteristic of the red-green graph plus the number of vertices, okay? But the number of faces in the red-green graph is just the number of red loops plus the number of green loops, right? This is just... So now we play exactly the same game for having erased the other two loops. Uh, I mean, the other colors. So we can also do this counting of blue-green and blue-red. Right, so that's the equation on top. So now add them together, right? Then you get two times the number of blue plus the number of green plus the number of red loops, right? But what you are after is exactly this Fb plus Fg plus Fr. That gives us the total number of loops, which is the total power of n. So just a trivial algebraic step. You, you say that f total is 3v over 2 plus 3 minus the genus of the blue-green minus the genus of the blue-red minus the genus of the green-red. OK, now you're basically done. Because you see that as you increase the genus, you are always suppressing the power of n, right? Because what you have, what you're your goal is to find precisely the cent, uh, f total. Yeah, f total is, uh, so the total power of n is, is n to the f total, right? And f total is f green plus f red plus f blue. And you solved it. You basically see that f total is that uh, that uh, equation, 3v over 2 plus 3 minus g minus g minus g. So you see that this f total is bounded from above by 3v over 2 plus 3, right? So the maximal graph which dominates at large n is the one where the genus of each of this double line graph, where you erased one of the colors, is zero. And that's exact, so you cannot beat that. So the maximum power, therefore, is exactly n cubed g n to the 3 halves v. It's just, yeah, so n to, right, you see where this comes from, right? Yeah, it's g to the v 
uh, so the power that we get so the, the weight of the graph will be g to the v uh, n to the f total and this will be g to the v and assume that, all gr uh, that you have f total which is maximal will be n to the 3 uh, plus 3v over 2 this is exactly n cubed times, uh, uh, times g g n to the 3 halves to the power v but this is exactly our lambda right so so you see that this is n cubed lambda to the power v so that proves it basically so you cannot beat this uh, there will not be any graph that exceeds this n scaling and we saw in practice how how just by grinding out these combinatorial factors it works but this is the kind of proof you want to all orders. So, so this proves that lambda, when this is held fixed, this gives you the ex absolute maximum sca uh, scaling, right? Because f total is bounded. The trick is that g can never be less than zero, right? So, so positive g always gives you submaximal graphs. And so it's a very beautiful proof. I think it was constructed by Gurao and collaborators back in 2010 or something like that and here we're adapting it to a somewhat simpler model than the ones they constructed which is the O n cube model I think O n cube is just um, maybe this one of the simplest tensor models where things fly it, that, there is a tiny bit more combinatorics to prove that the ones that dominate are all melons. Like that if indeed you make gene a zero in each one, that uh, it's a little bit more elaborate, but you can prove that then the d you basically prove that this is the dominant term, you, nothing can beat it, then I emitted another sub lemma that these are all melons. You basically need to show that there are some length to loops and uh, it's a little bit more combinatorial, but that, that basically proves it. And then, the, just in the remaining couple minutes, I wanted to flash <coughs> the model in in, <coughs> in d equal one dimension, the quantum mechanical model, which is equivalent to S Y K. So so far, I solved the d equal zero model for tensors, at least formally, right? Uh, in this large n limit. I think you heard a lot from Juan about the SYK model. And then the big uh, news was then Witten wrote down a quantum mechanical model that was in late October, uh, which used the elements of these tensor models, but was in zero plus one dimension. So they tended to always work in zero dimensions. And he wrote down this kind of model with uh, <clears throat> but this model as if actually has O n to the six symmetry. It has four different types of tensor fields which can contain different indices. So it's a little bit involved, uh, but it does have this sort of basic tetrahedral interaction. But then in an effort to simplify the it turns out that this model is not exactly equivalent to SYK it appears to be equivalent to one of the generalized SYK models that Gross and Rosenhaus wrote down. <coughs> but then Tarnopolsky and I wrote down a model with just a single type of tensor, fermionic tensor, which is exactly like <coughs> taking this uh, model for phi ABC and replacing phi by psi and then doing it in in uh, zero plus one dimension. <coughs> so, so this is the the specific quantum mechanical model that we considered, and then you can gauge it, gauge each of the ONs by replacing this derivative by covariant derivative. All that this is going to do, since these A's are non-dynamical, they're like Lagrange multipliers. 
is just going to truncate the spectrum of states to on cross on cross on singlet wave functions and this is uh, uh, so th this I sort of wrote down before already on the blackboard that you can think of the this interaction as a kind of tetrahedron so you can think of this uh, this vertex as a kind of view of the tetrahedron from the side uh, and then you just work out the, gra the Feynman graphs and with these colorful propagators gluing the tetrahedra together. Uh, and the crucial thing is that when you write down the Schwinger-Dyson equation, for example, in this quantum mechanical model, they turn out to be the same at leading order as, as the SYK Schwinger-Dyson equations. Uh, you basically have to do this summation and this gives you a very interesting result in uh, zero plus one dimension. You get a kind of almost conformal field theory. The dressed propagator solution is just the sine over T1 minus T2 to the one half, for example. So this tells you that uh, the field psi acquires dimension one quarter. And then you can obtain uh, a solution for the four-point function, which is basically the same as an SYK model. And basically, here is the spectrum of uh, of the solution. So the st the the weights, basically the scaling dimensions of two particle composite operators, are through this magic of Schwinger-Dyson equation, are just obtained by solving the equation that this function is equal to one, right? So it's one of these very simple graphical equations that you can solve. So this just, this is like a souped up version of the Schwinger-Dyson solution that I did there, but now you do it in, in uh, zero plus one dimension. And here is the spectrum. So this, the lowest solution is exact and it's H equal two. That's exactly this, sort of graviton mode or gravity mode that Juan discussed in the lecture before me. And then there are some higher kind of massive modes and, and so on. So this gives you a kind of version of SYK model without any necessity of disorder, therefore. Because you just have these ON cube models. Magically in the large end limit, it, it just becomes uh, sort of the same model, and uh, I think I should stop here, but, but it just shows you that these tensor models do have interesting dynamics in them. They also, I view them as slightly better defined than the SYK model because you, they have more symmetries. So for example, you, you have this ON cubed symmetry, there is no randomness, you can gauge it. So that's uh, why it's attracting a lot of interest now, so I think I'll, stop at this point. <laughs> but uh, I'll post these files so you can have a look at, uh, at uh, and there will be a discussion session, so, yeah, question. Yeah, yeah I'm a bit even confused how you compute one of our end corrections in SYK model because there is some inherent fluctuations in J to begin with. But indeed, they, they absolutely don't agree. Even just the powers don't agree because, uh, because here, what, what, what the SYK, so the N of SYK is our N cube. And we certainly see things, we see things like one over N for sure and maybe even one over root N. So, so in tensor models, the tensors contain corrections like 1 over n, which is like 1 over n SYK to the 1 third, or perhaps even 1 6. Well, well in SYK you just have 1 over n, n SYK, but... Yeah, it's a different theory. Another th thing that I wanted to emphasize is that, and this is something that we stressed in our paper, is that we have a lot more operators in this theory that are singlets because we can contract uh, like psi to the many, many psi's. There are some huge number of ways of contracting them. 
these are all present in the theory. While in SYK model, people only focused on this sort of one special subset of operators. I see no reason how you could ever remove these. So, so I think this tensor theory obviously has a huge number of additional massive states and there should be bulk of stuff co corresponding to them. But this is a very striking thing that we clearly see one over n, which is one over this little n to the one third. And they, so, so, it's, so it seems like the same theory in the large n limit, but even that is not completely clear. For, it agrees for some variables, but it doesn't agree for others. To me, this model is much more in the usual spirit of gauge gravity duality, because after you gauge it, it's just a gauged quantum mechanics model. Uh, while SYK is like a very unusual sort of random theory, a theory with random coupling. Uh, but they do meet for, uh, through the Schwinger Dyson equations. Yeah, perhaps, but but yeah, but I mean this re replica uh, O N symmetry is a bit, yeah. He and here the, the model does have more symmetry even in that case. Yeah, yeah, it's possible, but uh, yeah, I think it's. If in search of gravity dual, I would feel safer looking at this model because it's more uh, conventional gauge quantum mechanics. But yeah, the problem is not solved for I either model. Like because in this one, clearly you would have to reproduce a huge growth of massive states, uh, so it would be a pretty complicated gravity dual. I think. Yes. Uh, so mm -hmm. in zero Let's say the forward tensor model that we spoke about the body size. The the colored one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the the one so the, the one that uh Gora originally considered with these four different uh yeah, yeah, like let me just uh yeah, if you take this type of model but for bosons and then there are four different types of bosons, so with O n to the six symmetry. That definitely has a melonic uh, limit. Yeah. Oh, four tensors. Four tensors. Yeah, all of them, yeah, you can show that they're all melonic, provided we take special tetrahedral like interactions. And are those then also four tensors? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think all those. Uh, yeah, as far as I remember, they're all solvable through the Schwinger Dyson. Yeah, basically, the, when you have uh, this Schwinger Dyson solution, it's sort of both g good news and bad news. The good news is that you can really resum this whole set of graphs, but it's also a sign that it's not uh, a very rich theory. <laughs> sort of. Yeah. Okay. I guess we're all hungry, so uh, I can certainly answer more questions in private. <laughs>